Welcome back to Menopause Barbie and our discussion on hormones. This is menopause, your management, your way, now and for the rest of your life. And this is tutorial number 25. Today we're going to be on pages 109 to 111 in the book and page 26 in the outline notes. So there you have your bearings for following along. So we're going to be talking about each of the hormones. And the first hormone we're going to concentrate on heavily is the hormone estrogen. Now that you know what estrogen is and how it plays a major role in your menopausal experience, you need to know its sources, right? You need to know where it comes from. So that way, whether you look to find estrogen or you're interested in avoiding estrogen, you'll know how to do either one. So as you know, I'm completely unbiased about all this stuff. And in my presentation on menopause, my goal is to just give you information so that you can do whatever you want with it. And so we're going to cover all the sources of estrogen in all the categories. There are three broad categories of estrogen. There are plant sources of estrogen. There are bioidentical sources of estrogen and there are synthetic pharmaceutical sources of estrogen. So today we're going to start by discussing phytoestrogens. Now you might think, what in the world is a phytoestrogen? Well, phyto means plant and estrogen means estrogen. So we are discussing plant sources of estrogen. Phytoestrogen means plant sources of estrogen. So this includes plants, which have the hormonal effect of estrogen, and botanicals, which have the hormonal effect of estrogen, and herbs, which have the hormonal effect of estrogen. So phytoestrogens are all the plants that have estrogen in them. And they're important because some of these plants constitute foods and spices that you eat. <laughs> in this tutorial and the next two tutorials, we're going to talk about the basic science behind phytoestrogens because it's really important. And after that, I'll present you with the actual foods that are phy phytoestrogens. Now, a few tutorials ago, it was tutorial number 23 to be exact, I taught you that hormones exert their effects by binding with a receptor. So there are two words that we need to explain here. The first word is receptor and the second word is binding. So let's pretend that this puzzle piece is a human molecule. So your body's made up of all these molecules. This is one molecule in your body. Okay, this, I go, here I go with my goofy puzzle pieces again, but they, they, they're, they're very good for helping you understand things. So this is a human molecule in your body. This open area of your puzzle piece allows you to snap pieces together, right? When you build a puzzle, this is how you build the puzzle, by snapping the pieces together. Well, a receptor is the word that we give to this portion of a molecule that allows the molecule to attach to another molecule. So we call these openings receptor sites. Think of this receptor site as a parking space. It's a parking space that's just sitting there empty. It's waiting for a car to park in it. Receptor sites are specific. They're, they're picky. They'll only allow certain hormones to attach to them. So they're all sitting there empty, waiting for the right hormone to attach. To use our parking space analogy, only certain vehicles are allowed to park in any given parking space. You know how it is when you're circling in a parking lot and you're looking for a place to park and finally you see an empty spot, but you drive up to it and when you get there you see a sign and the sign says parking for CVS customers only or something like that. Well, that's how this is. Hormone receptor sites are exactly like that. They are empty parking spots that will only allow a specific kind of molecule to park there. So let's say this parking spot right here is an estrogen receptor. So this parking spot 
in other words, receptor site, is just sitting here waiting for an estrogen molecule to attach to it. And the only thing an estrogen receptor site can attach to is a molecule of the hormone estrogen. Only estrogen will do. Okay, so let's pretend that this puzzle piece, it's a human estrogen molecule. In your body, you have estrogen floating around, or you used to. <laughs> let's pretend that this puzzle piece is an estrogen molecule that's floating around nearby. It's looking for an estrogen receptor site to bind to. In other words, it's an estrogen car and it's looking for an estrogen parking spot. So the estrogen car, estrogen molecule, floats by, it sees this estrogen parking spot, and it says, that's just what I'm looking for. I am gonna park in that estrogen parking spot. So it fits itself into the parking spot, and this process of attaching the hormone molecule to the receptor site, or parking the car, is called binding. That's what we call binding. So until this hormone binds with the receptor, it's useless. Before binding, this estrogen molecule was just floating around, it was doing absolutely nothing. And once it binds with the receptor and attaches itself to the hormone, it acts activates the hormone to do its job. So the hormone molecule attaches to your human molecule, your body's molecule, and that activates it so that it can do the job. Okay, so now it's active. So another way to think about this is to use the analogy of a lock and key. Okay, so this receptor site is now a lock. It's a lock. And an estrogen molecule is the key. This is actually one of those brain teaser puzzle things that I found <laughs> to demonstrate this. And it's just, it, it, it helps to visualize what, what I'm trying to teach you. So when this estrogen molecule inserts itself into the lock, look, I can't even, I can't even make it fit right, but when it inserts itself into the lock, it can open the lock. Okay, so now there's one other term that comes into play with this binding, and it's the word affinity. Affinity is the measure of attraction between the receptor site and the hormone that binds with it. Affinity is no different than sexual attraction between humans. You know, first comes attraction, then comes fit. So let's say you meet a man and you're attracted to him, but it takes dating him for a while before you know how good a fit you are, right? How drawn you are to another person is affinity. How well two people fit determines how long they stay together and how successful their relationship is. So if we use our lock and key analogy, the best fitting key is the one that will open the lock. So what you have is an estrogen lock here looking for an estrogen key here. And when the estrogen key inserts itself in the lock, how well it opens the lock is going to depend on how perfectly it fits. You know, my husband and I wrote a novel on our love story. And the novel's called Honey, I'm Home. It looks like this, and it's all true. Our story's all true. <laughs> Very good love story. <laughs> anyway, during our getting to know each other process, we referred to this phenomenon of affinity or attraction as the jiggy, jaggy, lock, and key theory. That was our way of explaining how attracted we were to each other. So. I'm gonna read what George wrote to me in an email because we had a long distance email love affair at first. I lived in Australia and he lived in Seattle and we sent emails back to each other for 20 days. 1,500 pages worth of emails in 20 days. Okay, so I'm gonna read you one of these emails. He sent this to me on November 3rd, 2004. 
Barbie, hold up a house key horizontally and look at the pattern of jigs and jags in its teeth. Some keys have only a few jigs and jags. Others have very pronounced profiles with high, sharp peaks and deep valleys. Locks have to comp complement the keys that open them up. So, a jiggy jaggy key will only fit into a jiggy jaggy lock. People are like locks and keys. Most people have few jigs and jags, and keys with very few jigs and jags may fit pretty well in most locks. The more jig jagged the key, the less likely it will open any given lock. I'm a very jagged key, and bland locks bore me. Locks, locks with lots of jigs and jags are fascinating to me, although the chance of a jiggy jaggy lock and my jiggy jaggy key lining up becomes very remote. I have never found a fascinating jiggy jaggy lock whose jigs complemented my jags such that we want to actually unlock possibilities. The past does not determine the future though. You're a very jiggy jaggy lock, Barbie. And while all your jigs and jags aren't the same as my jigs and jags, your jigs complement my jags and vice versa. Together, we hold the key to unlocking a future in which all of our dreams can come true. Love, your jagged key. <laughs> it's a fun love story. You can find it on my website or go to amazon.com. It's called Honey, I'm Home by Barbie Taylor and George Walton. Anyway, fun story. It gets the principle across, okay? The, the principle of affinity, of attraction, is the same. So the receptor site has the highest affinity for the best fitting molecule and a lower affinity for any ill-fitting molecule. Okay, so what you have here is you have our human molecule and you have this estrogen molecule that your body produced. It's a perfect fit, okay? Here you have another molecule that isn't a perfect fit. It's hard for me to hold them all at once, but this one is very loose and it barely fits. There's all this dead space between the pieces. In the case of hormones, joining of the most correct hormone to a receptor site is going to produce a completely different effect than joining with a less correct hormone. So the better the fit, the better the effect. So think about what would happen if you snap, if you were doing a jigsaw puzzle and you snapped the wrong piece into your puzzle. Let's say you put in a piece that almost fits and then you go ahead and continue putting your puzzles, puzzle together. Well, eventually, you're gonna realize something's wrong, right? Your picture's not gonna look right and you're not gonna be able to finish your puzzle. So applying this to our hormones, it goes like this. If a substance has a really high affinity for a receptor, that means it's very attracted to it and it's very likely to bind and it'll produce a very strong effect. And if a substance has a low affinity for a receptor, it's less attracted to it and it's less likely to bind. But if it does bind, it's going to produce a much weaker effect. That makes sense, doesn't it? It's no different than saying that the stronger the attraction between two people, the better their relationship will be. And the weaker the attraction between two people, the weaker their relationship will be. So the greater the affinity a receptor has for a certain type of hormone, the stronger that, that, the effect that hormone has once it occupies the receptor site. In other words, the stronger the attraction, the greater the effect once the two people become a couple. So if this similar, let me, let me, if this phytoestrogen, which is similar, but not perfect hormone fits into this receptor site, it produces a weaker hormonal effect. So if someone settles for a partner who's similar to their perfect partner, but not really the perfect one, their bond's gonna be weaker. So why is all this important? It's important because phytoestrogens are the weaker, less than perfect fitting hormones for estrogen receptor sites. They're similar, 
but they're not perfect. They're not the perfect partner. Okay, and the attraction, the affinity of a phytoestrogen for this receptor site, for this estrogen molecule, is much lower than this one. The affinity of an estrogen molecule for an estrogen receptor site is only, look at this, one fifteen hundredth to one eleven thousandth as great as that of the estrogen that's in your body. That's a lot. That means that your body's estrogen is fifteen hundred to e oops, got it backward, didn't I? Fifteen hundred to eleven thousand times as attracted as the phytoestrogen. And the strength of a phytoestrogen once it binds is also much lower. The strength of a phytoestrogen once it binds is only one one hundredth to one one thousandth as strong as your body's natural estrogen. So what you have here is your body's or a pharmaceutical estrogen and the strength is one and the affinity is one. Here you have a phytoestrogen. Its strength is one one hundredth to one one thousandth of what this is. And its affinity is one fifteen hundredth to one eleven thousandth of what this is. This one is one hundred to one thousand times stronger and fifteen hundred to eleven thousand times more likely to bind with the estrogen receptor site. You see here that human and pharmaceutical estrogen are pretty similar in strength, okay? So human and pharmaceutical estrogens are pretty similar, but the phytoestrogen, much lower. So this difference in the strengths of your body's estrogen or pharmaceutical estrogen and phytoestrogen is hugely, hugely important in the management of your menopause. So why is that? Well. It's because there are many advocates in the alternative and complementary world that tell you to avoid foods that contain estrogen because they're afraid that phytoestrogens are too strong and that you'll get too much if you, ha if you eat foods with estrogen in them. And then there are other people also in the alternative and complementary medicine world that encourage you to use phytoestrogens and eat phytoestrogens instead of taking pharmaceutical estrogen because their thought is the pharmaceutical estrogens are too high a dose or too, too strong, but the phytoestrogens aren't. In other words, these two groups, both within the alternative and complementary world, contradict each other. One group recommends that you ingest phytoestrogens, the other recommends that you avoid them. So one is saying they're, they're dangerous, the other one's saying they aren't dangerous. And then contrast that with a lot of people in the traditional medical community who believe that phytoestrogens have no effect at all. So you're getting mixed messages. You're getting all this information from different groups of people. See, I hate it when there are scare tactics that confuse you because all it does is keep you from knowing the facts. So the truth about all of this is really, really very simple but I'm not gonna explain it to you right now. This is sort of like a cliffhanger in a good novel. No, I want to give you some time to consider what we've talked about today. It's very important to understand the basic science that I taught you today before we move on. So I'm going to let you digest this for a while and in the next tutorial, I'm gonna explain exactly how these principles that I taught you today pertain to phytoestrogens. And that way, you'll be able to decide for yourself which line of thinking seems most logical for you. Okay? It's not about scare tactics, it's about understanding the facts. So we've covered a lot today, and I hope you found it helpful. And if I had to summarize this, I would simply say this. I would say, estrogens vary in their strengths, which means that 
all estrogens are not created equal. And that's where we're going to pick up in the next tutorial. Be sure you watch this one before you go to the next one, okay? All right, I'll see you then. Bye!